So I wanted to make sure that our speakers have ample time to do their presentations. Good morning. I wanted to start by introducing our great panel today. And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Robin Miyamoto, who will be presenting first. She completed her um, degree in psychology, clinical psychology at Argosy University in Honolulu, and her postdoctoral fellowship in clinical psychology uh, with health psychology emphasis at Tripler Army Medical Center. She continues to serve there as a clinical supervisor at the Integrated Behavioral Health Program at Waimanalo Health Center for five years and eventually director of fellowship training until 2008. She's a founder of Iola Lahui and served as director of training from 2008 to 2013. She's currently an assistant professor at the John A. Burns School of Medicine in the Department of Native Hawaiian Health. Her areas of interest include diabetes, renal disease, and cancer. She has served on the American Psychological Association Committee of State Leaders and is past president of the Hawaii Psychological Association and the chair of the Legislative Committee. And she's my friend. <laughs> I'm going to do all the introductions up front so we can seamlessly move through the presentations. Following uh, Dr. Miyamoto, we'll have Diane Paloma. Diane Paloma, Dr. Diane Paloma, has spent the past 18 years in the healthcare field and able to combine her passion for Native Hawaiian culture with health and the medical field. She has been at the Queens Medical Center since 2006 and is a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools and received her bachelor in psychology in uh, her BS in psychological science from UCLA and her MBA from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And recently, we're so proud, her, her PhD in healthcare administration from Capella University. And last, closing the program, and we will have some time for questions and answers briefly, uh, is Dr. Neil Palafox, professor and former chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. Dr. Palafox worked in the Marshall Islands for 10 years, serving five years as a medical director for preventive health services and public health. He has led a US-funded program to care for the radiation-affected people of the Republic of the Marshall Islands from 1998 to 2008. And since 1995, Dr. Palafox has worked on health disparities and developing cancer health care systems in the US-affiliated Pacific Islands. I think you're going to really appreciate and learn a lot from these three. So I'm going to get started with Dr. Miyamoto. And you want to do your own? Or yeah. You? Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm not Dr. Kamana Opono Crab. Um, he, was, he was supposed to be our speaker this morning. I was unable to make it, so um, I was asked to fill in at the last minute yesterday, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to be talking about Native Hawaiian healthcare advocacy and policy this morning. I'm going to find the button right here. Okay. So um, the Native Hawaiian Healthcare Improvement Act was initially passed in 1988 and reauthorized a few years later. This was really a mandate from the federal government to make it the policy of the United States to take care of the health of, of the Native Hawaiian people, to raise the health status, and to provide existing Native Hawaiian healthcare programs with the resources that they needed in order to effectuate these changes. Um, this was kind of a top-down approach to things. It came with a tremendous amount of money over the years, um, which has benefit, benefited the Native Hawaiian healthcare system and brought services to a lot of areas. Unfortunately, what we've seen with the, the money that came into the state and the way in which um, it was used is that we are um, 20 years later and the, status, the health status of Native Hawaiians has not gotten better, and in fact, in some cases, has gotten worse, to the point where we have a public health crisis with Native Hawaiian health. The Native Hawaiians continue to suffer the worst health inequities in our state. Um, you can see, oh, I forgot to say, because this presentation was so last minute, it's truly a kako effort. So some of these slides are, are courtesy of Mary Oneha and Kiawe Koholokula and Kialoha Fox. Um, so the, the health status, um, you can see the disparities that Native Hawaiians are overrepresented with regards to heart attack, overweight and obesity, 
diabetes, asthma, and um, current smoker. And you can see we are, uh, Native Hawaiians are leading in all areas uh, except hypertension with those inequities. Um, tremendous rates of overweight and obesity, smoking, um, depression, diabetes, and then also looking at income and high, uh, education, which um, has to do with the, the social determinants of health that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's important to note that, again, with all of that money that's come into the state, we have made changes in the health status. Native Hawaiian life expectancy has increased by almost 12 years since 1950. The bad news is that that continues to be um, a little more than six years lower than the state average. Native Hawaiian heart disease mortality has dropped by 50% since 1960, but that's still twice the mortality rate of non-Native Hawaiians, and the disparity has actually increased. So the amount that um, cardiac mortality has gone down um, in the non-Native Hawaiian population is much greater than that in the Native Hawaiian community. You can see that um, as recent as um, 2010, the leading causes of death um, for Native Hawaiians continue to be um, to mimic the state average, but at much higher rates. So heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and accidental injuries, which include suicides, are much higher compared to all other ethnicities in the state. When we talk about um, improvement in Native Hawaiian health, one of the things that we're looking at is the Native Hawaiian population projections. And the good news is that the numbers are going up, and what's estimated to be the case in, in 2050 is that we'll, there will be close to a million Native Hawaiians um, spread between Hawaii and the continent. The problem is with these health disparities is that we are going to inherit a very unhealthy population, and that we need to do something to affect health so that those one million Hawaiians are healthy and contributing um, to the workforce. Um, the Department of Native Hawaiian Health, and, and Mele Look is a big part of this assessment and, and is here today, um, her ULU network identified um, concerns, and this is over 70 sites across the state looking at what are the top medical concerns. And you can see that these mirror those um, inequities that we were talking about. Diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and behavioral health issues are the top identified concerns. Substance abuse has dropped a little bit. Um, I think we're maybe um, keeping up a little bit with, with the crystal meth epidemic, so that's gone down. Um, but the chronic health conditions continue to be a huge concern for these communities, and we need to start to look at what we're gonna do about it. And it was, it was really interesting being in the, the presentation um, this morning with um, Andrew Weil because he was highlighting the mistakes that as a nation we've made um, with health care. And I think in Hawaii, you know, collectively we've made a lot of those same mistakes. We've um, not focused on um, sustainability or quality um, or tracking outcomes and we need to do better. And because of that, um, a, a group of um, Native Hawaiian health um, organizations got together to form the Limahana Olonu Puha, which is a Native Hawaiian health consortium. And the idea was um, to, again, what he was talking about this morning, that we need trust and we need to build on the resources that we have and the strengths that we have, is looking at these organizations, how we can work together to try to improve the health status of Native Hawaiians. So it's a partnership amongst um, several organizations serving different roles, looking at a cultural base, um, a research base, and then trying to affect change at all levels of healthcare in order to improve those health outcomes. Um, the purpose and objective of the consortium is to try to leverage the resources that we have locally to improve the physical, emotional, and spiritual health status while also trying to bring in federal funding to match that state funding and how we can um, work together in order to increase the dollars that are coming into our state. This is a nice little visual of our current partners, and you can see that we have funders, we have academic institutions, service providers, payers, um, and education working all together. Um, the problem that we've faced in Native Hawaiian Health for a long time is that we focus on, um, in health, we focus on biopsychosocial factors, which are really important, but for a long time, I think the Native Hawaiian healthcare system, we've ignored 
a good part of what is affecting the health of Native Hawaiians. And we need to start to look at the social determinants of health. We need to look at the historical context. We need to look at social and economic status and how that's affecting the healthcare system. And that's a main focus of um, Lono Puha. So the logic plan that we put together to organize um, how we're going to move forward with things are organized around the four corner posts of Ahale or the Napokihi. I'm going to talk about those areas really quickly. So um, Keau O'ivi, which is creating and maintaining a Kanaka O'ivi space. Kamalama Aina, which is creating and maintaining healthy environments for Native Hawaiians. Ka'aipono, which is uh, Native Hawaiians accessing healthier lifestyles. And Kavaiola, which is Native Hawaiians accessing the institution, institutions and benefits of society. And what's really nice is this gives a cultural foundation for our logic plan moving forward, but it matched up very nicely with the National Prevention Council action plan for looking at national preventive strategies in order to affect changes within health. So our four pokihi line up really nicely with their four areas. We took all of this information to the Office of Minority Health, which falls under the Department of Health and Human Services, and working with um, Nadine Gracia and Dr. Ko, have a five-year cooperative agreement to um, work together with OMH to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities, work on the Lonopuha Action Plan along with OHA Strategic Plan, and it fits really nicely with the Office of Minority Health. Our first project has been to have a year-long joint partnership with OMH and the National Partner for Action to um, adapt a health disparities curriculum to be implemented um, across the education system from high school all the way up to medical school. What we know right now from the Department of Native Hawaiian Health's assessment of what's been working so far in these communities is that we need more programs that integrate cultural values and practices. We need health promotion strategies and preventive strategies, programs that address social determinants of health, um, looking at integrated primary care along with culturally competent care, and looking at the collaborations and partnerships that are going to maximize those resources and lead innovation and sustainability. Workforce development is going to be a huge piece of that, and then looking at ways to um, invest in community resources to promote healthy behaviors. So my closing slide is kind of our next step for what's going to happen in order to promote those changes. Is that this next legislative session, there will be a Native Hawaiian Health Improvement Plan Task Force um, that we're going to go to the legislature for in order to um, try a state-based plan for improving Native Hawaiian health instead of that federal top-down plan to look at the resources we have in our state and how we can um, develop a, a sustainable healthcare improvement plan moving forward. And we're going to be looking specifically at accessing Native Hawaiian data, um, increasing those collaborations. There's going to be specific legislation to address social determinants of health and then support community organizations in promoting their own health um, in their own communities. Thank you very much. Dr. Diane Paloma. Okay, so I'm gonna try and do this in 10 minutes. Aloha mai kako. How oli ku umaka e ikea o ko pakahia pau no keya kuleana ko kako kuleana. This is all of our kuleana, not just the panelists up here and not just you in your um, work. What I'm gonna be doing today, mahalo to Robin for giving like the first half of the presentation that I usually give. Um, I'm going to jump right into looking at what we're doing at Queens specifically. Specifically, So we've gone from Native Hawaiian Health and then our consortium. Um, I'm, a, I'm a hollow, so I, don't I can save some time because I don't have to talk about that one. And I'm just going to really whittle it down and go through all of the things that um, Queens is doing specific to Native Hawaiian Health. So I won't be talking about... Um, Compact of Free Association, I'll save that for Neil. I won't be talking about a lot of the financial mechanisms. I'm just going to be really giving a big, broad overview, and you can always contact me later if you want to know a little bit more of the specifics. Uh, page it out. Okay, so um, we developed the Native Hawaiian Health Program. I came to Queens in about 
2006. And it's not to say that Queens was not doing Native Hawaiian health before. We've done Native Hawaiian health uh, for about 154 years. Um, but I think it was at the discretion of the board at the time to really develop a concerted, focused effort within Queens, so not relying on external partners, but to do it from within. And they created this uh, program office, which I was the first director for, um, still am, um, and we have since grown. Um, we actually just lost one person to UH Jane on the right, but we're really just three FTE. Um, we have a medical director, Dr. Gerard Akaka. We have a clinical data coordinator, Ms. Joanne Kimura, and we have an administrative secretary, uh, Ms. Janine Johnson, and that's us. It. We do this by ourselves. But we do it through um, a number of strategies, and so I like to call myself the Jackie of all trades, master of none, because you'll see throughout this presentation that I am kind of doing a little bit of everything, but that's what makes my job so fun. And the real um, impetus for this specific department within Queens really drove um, two things. Um, looking at the major health issues and prioritizing those needs for Native Hawaiians, which we've all seen. We know that um, the health status of Native Hawaiians is not the best. Um, but what could we do at Queens to align ourselves with those? So looking at Queens' strengths, and we're very well known for our acute care, um, and a lot of the specific things like cancer, um, oncology, cardiac, care. And of course, this is within a hospital-based system. And so what my job is to really kind of marry the two, and you can see our little uh, logical uh, flow model, um, that at the bottom, the Native Hawaiian health strategies are really this marriage of Queen's strengths on what, we're, what we think we're good at in the hospital and um, prioritizing the needs or responding to the health needs of Native Hawaiians in that sense. So I'm going to go through these areas, the clinical outcomes, healthcare training, access and outreach and research, in a very broad view. So you can see the breadth, I think, of what Queens is doing. Um, we started off in the first three years looking at cardiac, oncology, and comprehensive weight management. Comprehensive weight management is our bariatric surgery program um, addressing obesity. And we did specific things in each of those, and we brought in a lot of the staff from those areas, whereas I'm not the one telling them what they should be doing for Native Hawaiians, but letting them develop it, again, with, in partnership with them because they are the ones who are on the floors. They are the ones delivering the care directly to our patients. Um, so in cardiac, we had a lot of um, uh, out-of-the-box kinds of ob objectives and initiatives. One of the, the most famous things that the cardiac service line is known for is using la'i in the room. So we use la'i or tea leaves. Um, on site, on campus, and we can bring them up to the patient room given that um, infection control um, you know, all of the other uh, sidebar stuff. Um, but you can, um, they'll offer la'i upon arrival um, to one of the cardiac floors and poi on the daily menu. So prior to this, you could not get poi regularly. Um, and, and we all know the benefits of poi and how that assists in healing, um, helps keep uh, medications down, and helps um, prevent you from getting uh, sick while in the office. Uh, so you don't necessarily want to come to Queens just so you can get poi every day, but um, I think that was one of the, the responsive things that what a lot of the patients really asked for in the hospital. Um, we do pharmacy consults upon discharge. When you, when you leave, a lot of our patients were leaving with 21 medications. I can't even take daily vitamins every day, so you can imagine the difficulty a patient has after a traumatic incident of taking those types of medications. So a pharmacist comes to bedside before their discharge charge to go over all of their meds and also follows up with them within 48 hours. Um, so when you get home and you look, you're not anything like, oh my goodness, what, what are all these meds for? Um, in oncology, I want to highlight the Molokai General Hospital, that's MGH Mammography on Island. Before we started that, we looked at um, our mammography um, timeframes for Molokai patients, and it took about six months for them to coordinate care, come to Oahu, schedule a day off of a work, bring a kako'o with them, all of that. Um, and, and helping, providing through some of our scholarships, a mammographer on island, um, MGAs did buy the equipment also, they can do mammography on island and usually on a same day basis. So you can call and um, that six month window had, has now shrunk to um, one day. Um, our comprehensive weight management, we looked at a study looking at bariatric surgery and the resolution of type two diabetes for native Hawaiians. 
Um, the study design on the far right is looking at the difference between RU and Y, um, which is gastric bypass, and gastric sleeve, where they actually sh shrink and shorten and cut in half almost um, your stomach. And looking at that, we recruited very, very heavily from the neighbor islands who do not have bariatric surgery options. And um, a result, a sidebar of that was that 51% of our current comprehensive weight management program is Native Hawaiian. And I just got five minutes to cover like a couple more stuff. Um, so the next three years looked at three different areas. Medicine, which is where our, where our basic, our founding, um, our founders really looked at um, in terms of a service line. Um, COPD, we created a lot of literature specific to um, Native Hawaiian culture and looking at our local population. Um, again, we mimicked the cardiac service line in providing an APRN and a pharmacist at bedside to do education while they're captured, um, a, a captured audience in our hospital. The neuroscience study looked at um, Native Hawaiians and onset of stroke, and Dr. Kazuma Nakagawa is um, excelling in this field. He initially found through our data that Native Hawaiians suffer from stroke 10 years younger than the rest of the population. So whereas he is, was seeing patients in San Francisco at about 70 or 80 years old, they're about 50 or 60 years old, still working for their families, often a lot of them supporting their families, and you can imagine the impact a stroke has on um, their families. Um, diabetes, again, we do this a lot through our APRN, so we're very, very strong advocates of APRNs and education. I'm gonna whiz by through. Um, another area is our healthcare training. We've created a lot of niche scholars, scholarships for allied health professions. Um, medicine, pharmacy, and nursing have very, very extensive scholarships available to them. They are degree granting, so they are eligible for financial aid. Um, however, uh, certificate or associates programs are not necessarily eligible for financial aid. Uh, radiological technician, respiratory therapy, all of these critically needed positions in our hospitals um, are not eligible for financial aid. So we've given what seems like a small return on uh, investment of about $2,000 per student can actually fund almost a whole year of their program. Um, we've also supported um, through our Ulukukui project, which just, which just uh, completed its sixth year at Stevenson Middle School, looking at supporting students, faculty, and families on the importance of going into science and going into a biomedical career. And we host um, about 200 students every year um, in a career and health fair. Um, in the area of research, I rely a lot on partnerships. Because we are a small unit, we don't have a lot of um, high, high income generating uh, researchers. Hopefully that can change in the next couple of years. Um, but we partner a lot with the Department of Native Hawaiian Health at the John A. Bo John A. Burns School of Medicine. Um, most of these are partnerships with either Office of Hawaiian Affairs, um, DNHH, to conduct research. And again, because we're a hospital, we're not always so good at getting out into the community. And through these research projects, I'm able to actually get out into the community and partner with these people who are already in the community to look at what are ways we can connect the hospital with the, uh, the community. And we do this through a lot of research projects. And finally, my favorite is the access and outreach. So in addition to all of these programs, I also oversee the history and the heritage of Queens. Um, King Kamehameha IV and Queen Emma, as you know, are our founders, and they responded, as a lot of our other ali'i did, to the, um, the unfortunate incidents that happened to our people. Um, I also house the Queen's Historical Room, so a lot of our unique treasures are um, housed at Queen's, such as um, Queen Lili Okalani's handwritten note requesting care for her husband, John Dominus Holt, handwritten. I was almost like bowing down towards this when I got to see it. Um, we do a lot of education and in-service trainings for departments. Um, we are the department to call when a patient has a question about the free care, and I say that in quotes because that's a whole other conversation that I could go into. Um, we also offer Hawaiian language for our employees, not only so that they can pronounce the names of our buildings, but pronounce the names of their patients. 
Um, and we really rely on a lot of our community collaborations and partnerships because we are such a small unit. Um, I have lots of friends, and I, I really like it that way, and I see a lot of you in the audience as well. And then one of our newest things, Queens West Oahu, we are going to be opening in the spring, um, and we are looking at targeting a lot of our leeward patients so that um, a majority of our Native Hawaiian people live on the west side um, and it, I think Queens West Oahu will bring a much needed service. Um, it doesn't mean that we are gonna be able to do it all. So again, I stress the importance of the community collaborations. Um, Robin uh, spoke eloquently about this. I'm gonna just skip to the very end. I always end with the Olelo no Eau, and we always try and incorporate some element of Hawaiian culture in, uh, as much as we can into a Western academic and hospital-based healthcare system. Iulu no kalala ike kumu, the branches grow because of the tree. So we are really extensions of our ancestors and um, we always reflect back to King Kamehameha IV and Queen Emma and our legacy. But all of us, I think, are extensions of people who have come before us, um, whether it have been you know, the trailblazers, Emmett Aluli, Claire Hughes, um, Kekuni Blaisdell, all of those people have really been the, the core and the center of what we're doing. And so I think it's our kuleana, everybody, to re reach out and just become a new branch. But yet we're all connected to that same kumula'au. So mahalo nui loa. And now we'll hear from Dr. Neil Palafox. Yahuikom, Rananim Kasalilea Ali. Today I'll be talking on the compact impact and the other Pacific Islanders. This session was about Native Hawaiian health and other Pacific Islanders. And in 10 minutes, I'm going to cover other Pacific <laughs> Islanders. Okay, how's it? Where's it down there? If I can figure out. How do I advance this? this piece? Okay. So the objectives are really, uh, because we have to cover a lot, um, I'm going to cover the area that has been really a flashpoint for Hawaii. And it's really the Micronesians in Hawaii. And even that terminology is wrong. So I'll be talking about the compact of free association and the compact impact in particular, the implications of Hawaii, and some things about the problem solving that surrounds this. And so where, where uh, are we talking about? Upper right hand is Hawaii. American Samoa is the most southern. The target is the Marshall Islands. That oval circle is the Federal States of Micronesia. And the um, far left small oval next to that is the Republic of Palau. And so what I'll be talking about, and the two areas north are Commonwealth Northern Marianas and Guam is south of that. But I will be talking about the target, Marshall Islands, the Federal States of Micronesia, and Palau. Those are the compact nations. And one of the things about this, we were talking about disparities, just to give you a, an idea. So people in the United States live to about uh, you know, 78, 79 now. And these compact nations, it's about 64, 65. The highest rates of obesity in the world, according to WHO, are all in the Pacific. The top three are, top, not top three, in the top five, three of them are in the US Associated Pacific, the compact nations. And the highest rate of cervical cancer in the world is in the Marshall Islands. It's higher than Zimbabwe, which is number two, which is in Africa. So when we talk about disparities, these areas have heavy disparities. And we're talking about NCDs, and they gave some nice um, numbers. Uh, from a preventable um, death from non communicable diseases below 70, it's just recently come out, the Marshall Islands has the highest in the world. So we're talking very big disparities from U.S. Associated Pacific areas called the Compact. So um, what is this Compact thing? First of all, I, we have to talk two seconds about this. The Compact is a treaty with the United States set up between these countries and the United States. It governs the military relationship, economic provisions, and the political relationship. What the essential point is that the military has con total control over these areas. 
The United States says we want control of these areas, airspace, who can come in and submarines and so forth, and we can build military bases and do nuclear testing. So that's what the military relationship is. In exchange for that, the US government says we'll give you some federal grants, we'll give you some operations money, but mostly they said for this, you can come back and forth to any territory, any state, live and work forever. So they are legally here in the United States because of this treaty. Forever, it's in perpetuity. And that's the treaty. There's three objectives that the compact had. One set up demogra democratic governments, the second one was the military thing, and the third one was self-sufficiency. Why this is important is a US government accountability office studied the compact, and the thing that was the objective has failed and is not gonna work, that's self-sufficiency. So if you're wondering why they're coming, self-sufficiency, which was an objective of this treaty, has not worked. And in 2003 and 2006, the US Government Accountability Office looked at it and said, you know what, it's not going to work. So keep those things in the back of your mind. So the compact impact, the compact impact, the therefore is that within these nations, they have generally poor health and education because you know, there's not enough money there. The, their self-sustainability didn't work out. Economic development is challenged, and therefore there's a lot, large out-migration. Where do they go? They, go to, they can go to any US territory, Guam, CNMI, they can come to Hawaii, they can go to Arkansas, which they do. 9,000 Marshallese in Arkansas, 4,000 Marshallese in California, 20,000 Marshallese in Hawaii, Guam, and CNMI. And what's the other thing about health, we have to focus on health a little bit, is that when the compacts started, these folks could come to Hawaii and they could be on federal Medicaid. That was the rules, because the compact started in 1986. In 1997, the United States government said, no, you're no longer qualified for Medicaid. So that's why they have become on state Medicaid requests, because the federal government, mid-compact, took them off the ability to get onto federal Medicaid. And so some pictures, and many of you have probably seen this, I use this in several talks. This is a picture from uh, Ebay Island, an island um, in the Marshall Islands next to the US military base. Um, such disparities, they don't even have enough fresh water there. There's 10,000 people that live on 66 acres next to the military base there. Um, so compact impact. So the Hawaii has estimated in 2010 that the compact impact populations have cost Hawaii $114 million. That's just in 2010. Now, just to show you that US GAO has also studied this, and they questioned even the validity of this. They said that this is probably a high overestimation. But the point is, Hawaii government, it's a formal letter to the uh, Department of Interior, says, you know what? The compact impact guys are costing us $114 million in 2010. The federal compact impact aid total is $30 million a year. But it has to be split between Hawaii, CNMI, and Guam. So therefore, Hawaii shares 11.1. My point in this is that if Hawaii shares 11.1 for compact impact aid, and they're costing Hawaii 114 million, big imbalance, causes a lot of issues. You know whether or not that top figure is correct or not. You know it, it's a big delta. So, socioeconomic economic indicators. The uh, Micronesians, and I, I'm using that word, the compact, in fact, folks that are in Hawaii, 35% have less than high school education. Okay, 34% with high school education, and 15% have some college or college degree. Most are in service occupations. You see many of them in McDonald's and uh, Jack in the Box airports, hotels, cleaning and service. So a majority of them, there obviously are some professionals. There's two attorneys I know, at least two attorneys, and there's uh, a two physicians that I know, but the point is, is most are in service occupations. They have high language access needs because English is their second or third language, and they're overrepresented in homeless shelters, as you know, in the court system, and in Hawaii's prisons. So they are way overrepresented as uh, the new immigrants, migrants here. So what is Basic Health Hawaii? Basic Health Hawaii was when the federal Medicaid um, couldn't take care of their health needs, they went on to the state Medicaid system, which is Quest. Because the federal government said no, Hawaii said yes, and they went on. The however is when Hawaii became strained, Hawaii wanted to push them off. So they developed 
what was called Basic Health Hawaii. So initially they said, you folks are going to get lesser class of health care, and this is what we're going to do for you because we can't, you guys are costing too much. And so they did, they tried to do this twice. The federal judge says, you can't do this to these people. You're targeting a specific class of people. This is against civil rights. You cannot do this. So, but it took a federal judge to stop Hawaii's government from doing this. But the, however, there's also however in this. Remember this morning, Mr. Weil talked about the um, access and how you have to give access. Otherwise, you actually, everybody costs more. The state of Hawaii still wants to let this go forward and have the US federal courts deny this. So they're still trying to take them off. So it's still problematic. And so it's just one of these things just to let you know, if you take them off, as was said before and we knew before, it'll actually cost you more, bad idea. And so basic Hawaii health timeline, I won't go into this um, too much, but anyway, um, so the previous administration wanted to put them on the special class called Basic Health Hawaii. Federal judge said you can't do that, and it's still kind of um, going forward, there, though there's a federal injunction against Hawaii fully implementing this. Now, Hawaii health expenditures. Hawaii spends about $9 billion annual in health care. Thank you. <laughs> and if you break that out per capita, you can see what that is in 2009, 2010. The compact nations, I'll show you a graph. So remember, Hawaii spends that and that. And so if I move to this, the United States spends that bottom line. This is how the US supports these countries, $9,225. $9, and so if you look at that, this is a picture of disparities, right? Per capita, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. And some of these areas that are US associated get like $150. So why do they come to Hawaii? Look at, look at this graph, and I'll tell you that in one, that, this one graph. There's 40 million annually for healthcare for COFA migrants that is spent in Hawaii. Now everybody says, oh, these migrants are spending way over the top, they're way out of control. But I calculated this out, it's actually, they're about 2% of Hawaii's population and spend about, let's say 5% of the health budget. So when people talk about they're way out of control, they are spending a higher proportion, but I wouldn't consider this way out of control. And part of the way out of control, perhaps, is our design of maybe not giving them access that they need. So the federal health remedies increase compact impact funds, legislation to allow the COFA migrants back onto federal Medicaid, and some, there's some bills in the federal uh, government that are trying to happen. Increased resources for the COFA nations because the original problem is we didn't take care of business back then when we were supposed to. We created a treaty. treaty has a lot of unintended consequences, and that's what we're seeing now. A lot of the unintended consequences for a plan and a treaty that went bad. So we reversed the 1996 thing, that thing, the uh, Pure uh, that said take the federal, free associated states folks off federal assistance. The state remedies, and this has been looked at a lot. I just want to say there was a 2004 Hawaii uninsured policy brief. I was fortunate to be on that. There was a COFA task force report to the legislature in 2009. Lots of very productive things that came out of that. Nowhere in either report did it say put in basic health away. So compact impact report to Hawaii State. The total is 115 million and so forth. What I wanted to point out in this is that a lot of people focus on health care as a big problem. The biggest health that the compact impact has positioned on Hawaii is not health, it's actually education. What education has to spend on healthcare in Hawaii is much bigger, not much bigger, it's significantly bigger than healthcare. So you can see the social determinants at work here. Poor education, a lot of costs, poor healthcare, a lot of costs. But unless you correct both, you're gonna continue the problem. And also, unless you correct both in their countries of origin, you're gonna continue this problem. The community remedies. A lot of people say, well, the Micronesians don't do anything for themselves. Well, I just want you to let, let you know there's lots of community groups, Micronesians United, Micronesian Community Na Network, nations of Micronesians, they're forming, they're trying to address this. There's new health community coalitions, a Mi Micronesian Health Advisory Council. There's a whole listserv that I'm fortunate, it's called COFA CAN. In other words, the compact of free associates that call COFA, you can do it, COFA CAN big network that's going around and trying to address some of these things. So 
The Compact Nations people are organized. They're trying to do this. They're not just sitting around in homeless shelters. And I just wanted to, because a lot of folks don't know that. There's many levels of arguments. There's a level of moral unfairness. So the US took, tested you know, nuclear testing and so forth. So there's a moral argument. There's a historical argument, just like the Native Hawaiians, the Kanaka Maoli. There's the data of, well, let's take them off these, you know, give them poor access and take them off. Real bad idea. It's, it's the wrong way to move if you're going to do something about that. And there's the legal the, uh, process things of how to work with the, you know, the nation's legal system as well as the, um, the local laws to correct this. And we can talk about the addressing all of this. So public, issue, public education and support, more federal support, um, international, we talked, and speaking as one voice. And I'll just say this, I'll say this out loud. And it's, it's a very uncomfortable position to hear. One of the biggest groups that pushes against the Micronesians is actually the Native Hawaiians. It's the Native Hawaiians who don't know about this in many of the areas. I gave several talks to folks in uh, Waianae area and talked to a lot of the youth, and they feel that there's too much competition for the small amount of health dollars from the Micronesians. That's why we, we they're, they're hard. But a lot of folks are moving away from that. But I can tell you that it's like, Two people in distress fighting for a small amount of dollars. They fight with each other. Wrong place to fight. But I needed to say that because you know that's what several of the Micronesian groups wanted me to articulate. It's not a negative thing. It's just the way it is. And I think it's an educational process. So that's what I had to say in a lot of different things. Speak with one voice. Work together. A lot of educational opportunity. And I think a lot of it is truly about understanding the history, the context, and going forward with this paradigm. Thank you very much. So in the short time we have left, before I open it up for questions, and I didn't even read the description of this session because I know you all can read and read your programs, but what I would like to ask the panelists is to just share, because all of you in the room are invested in health at some level, and you know, for the people sitting up here, this is not news. I mean, I, you probably took an old PowerPoint and just dusted it off a little bit because these are messages that have been out there for a long time. Despite new language about transformation and Affordable Care Act and all of the above, these are problems that uh, we have been wrestling with for a long time. But you're gonna hear a lot of things today. And so one of the things I'd like to ask, and I'll start with you, Robin, is, Thinking about who's in the audience today, what would be the one take-home message you'd like to have them take home? Thank you for letting me go first so I don't <laughs> get my point taken. But um, I think the, my biggest thing is, you know, transformation for me is thinking beyond healthcare, that we cannot just be pouring money into the healthcare system, that we need to think about those upstream causes. We need to think about education and income level and access to healthy foods and access to healthy environments. And so those social determinants of health are going to become um, a huge focus of things that we need people to be pushing that agenda because it's not necessarily common sense and it's something that we need to get to be a, a household term. Um, I think the one takeaway that I would like to uh, just share with you is that um, a lot of questions that I get asked in the community is that people don't know what Queens is doing. And it's because we're, I think, we're so involved and in the trenches and providing that care is that we don't really get out to toot our own horn every once in a while. Um, but at the same time, I think we rely on a lot of you. I think each of you have probably, probably been touched by Queens in some way, shape, or form. Um, and that we are here when you need us. We're that safety net hospital. Um, and that we are doing things for Native Hawaiians despite we don't always end up in the newspaper in that light. So um, I think I rely on a lot of the collaborations with you and the community to help share that message and that we are here. We're not, um, we're not very as closed off as I think we used to be in, in, in the far past, but we are here now and that I'm here and that I'm willing to be able to um, take kind of the hospital to your community, which is very, very foreign to us. We are, we're not really good at that. We're not always thinking about that when we first think of programs from the hospital. So maybe keep 
that in mind. Thank Call you. me up, see me when you're at the hospital for a happy event like births. Neil? Uh, thank you, Joanne. I think, um, to me, the, the mark of great people like Hawaii is the ability to take care of the poorest and the most disenfranchised. And in this case, it definitely is Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. And in context of that, uh, Kikuni Blaisdell always used to talk about the blue continent, this entire Pacific, and that it's one people. And so to come at this as one people, and that the, there's so much common history between the Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, as you can see in the threads that we all talked about, and to look at this as not us versus them, it's working with the principles that take care of, would take care of all the Pacific Islands and certainly all the people that are disenfranchised in many different ways. And I think that's, to me, the, the take home message. Thank you. I want to open it up for questions. We're going to have time for a few questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, I think there's quite a few people in the room. If you could go up to the microphone. Aloha. <clears throat> I'm uh, Poka Lainui out from Waianae side. I wanted to make some comments with regards to changing paradigms for healthcare. And what I'm seeing is that we still haven't made the distinction between the individual as opposed to group healthcare. And I think for indigenous people, we need to take a look at families, we need to take a look at the larger group, and we are stuck in the idea of treating individuals. So you take a diabetic, you will find in that diabetic's family, there are many people who are heading towards diabetes, a common cold. Many people within the family are heading for common cold, and yet we get stuck in this Western model of treating individuals and using these kind of statistics that only elevate individualism rather than the collective. That's point number one. The second is that we are working with a concept of Western-defined medicine rather than community-defined medicine. Sometimes when I get sick, I'm looking at what kind of oils I can use. Or I, I'm thinking about going down to Chinatown and looking at the pocket doctor who will diagnose by putting his hands on my, my wrist and all that kind of stuff. You know, we have so many medical availability, and yet we have the, the Western uh, delivery system that have captured the term health delivery system. And we have so many health opportunities, just the ocean going up to the mountain, and yet we eliminate that as part of the consideration of what health care is supposed to be all about. So I think we need to take that change in our, uh, our thinking. Another one is workforce. We continue to think of workforce as the, the, the area for academ academia. So you have to have a degree, you have to have a college education and the rest. But in the communities, the workforce are the people who are working with the people themselves. And yet we continue to ho'ohaule, continue to elevate the academics rather than recognizing the integrity of our workers in the community. I have a specific question with regards to spiritual health status, and that was an interesting term that was used. My question is, uh, how is it really measured? How do you measure spirituality? And I'm afraid of, uh, of the answer because I think the answer is going to be, again, a whole howly uh, explanation, and I don't think really one can measure spirituality. Too often we re just refer to that as religion. E kalamai poka. Yes. <laughs> All right. Clearly, we should have had you as a panelist on, yeah. on the panel, um, because I know you bring up a lot of points. I just want to have the, the speakers respond a little bit to, to your comments. Um, and I'm not sure which question you wanted to address, but there's going to be a chance for one. Okay, good. I, the, the points that you raised are, are excellent points, and I think have actually been raised in a lot of the different committees that we had for this healthcare transformation task force. I think um, looking at our payment system and how we're going to reimburse for healthcare, and you're right that we need to look at the family system. We can't look at the individual. Unfortunately, the payment system that we were given really supports reimbursement for that individual, and it supports reimbursement at a um, per visit. Um, situation, and, and I, I'm hoping that part of this transformation that we will start to look at paying for quality health care for the family, for an individual that can utilize traditional healing, that can um, utilize preventive services instead of always focusing on that acute care model and, and treating the individual. Um, 
The spirituality question is a hard one. I don't know if, if anybody has a, a, a good answer for that one. I, I was actually just going to reinforce uh, what you said that it's, um, and it's a statistic that will reinforce exactly what you said. And so if all the healthcare models in the Western paradigm work, the hospitals, the outpatient clinics, all of that work perfectly, and I mean perfectly, it will only affect 10 to 15% of healthcare outcomes. All the rest is social determinants. Make most, that's an actual fact. And so it has to move to the community, to the education, to the diff, different types of pro providers. And so I just want to reinforce that and I'll turn it over to Diane. So um, I really think that's an intriguing point because working for a hospital, we are just, I mean, we're, we're in this constraint of working within a Western healthcare model. Um, and we're struggling. We're looking to look outside the box and look at ways that we can look at collective things. There are, there are pieces here and there, but nothing that's really broad, overarching, and, and oversweeping. So that's, I think, all of our challenge is to look at that and to say, what, what can we do outside of what we already know and what we've just been accustomed to for so long um, I'd really like to engage with, with you on that and, and looking at that because, I, I mean, of course, I'm coming from a, a perspective of a very Western um, academic, medical, you know, inpatient hospital acute care system. Um, but we're, we're finding pockets here and there. Um, to address your um, question on spirituality, we do, have these we do have holistic APRNs who are trained in looking at spiritual things and looking at the connection between um, uh, coming to the root of the problem versus um, treating a symptom. And we are starting that um, within the constraints of a hospital setting, but we're looking at ways to do that. And so I think um, always engaging is is going to be the, the way that we move towards really finding a balance between the two. And I, I don't know if if they can exist um, in you know in parallel within each other, um, but there's things that we can do now to affect the future for that. And and if I may, one quick comment on spirituality. So on the spirituality part, as you know, you're talking about there's different models. There's a biomedical model. There's a biopsychosocial model social determinants model, but spirituality comes to me and there's something nobody likes to talk about. It's hard to frame. It's called caring. And so one of the measurements of uh, the outcome of spirituality is that there's an inclusiveness and that there's no disparities. To me, that's, the, that's caring about self, caring about community, caring about each other. That actually, if you talked about caring in the paradigm of how does that fit into health, if you just think about everybody about caring with each other, disparities goes away. You know, a lot of the family issues go away, but that's, to me, the marker of spirituality is the outcome, and there'll be no disparities, and we work inclusively. Thank you. I know that we've hit the 12 o'clock um, mark. I'm not sure what they're doing outside, if they're gonna hold you hostage for your lunch, but I'd like to continue the questions. If you wanna stay and ask the panelists questions for a few more minutes, that's fine with me. But I understand that some of you may have to leave. Clay, you have a question? No, no question? He's sending a love note to Diane. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions? Really? They're hungry. <laughs> oh no, okay. Sure. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Randy from Kauai. Uh -huh. um, I want to say thank you for especially speaking about Pacific Islanders. As a few years ago, I had the opportunity to work closely with them. And I see that they're obviously migrating to the neighbor islands. And uh, I saw that eventually that would occur. I think one of the things about being out of the box is um, reaching out to them in the way that they normally do, such as their churches and places of worship, so being spiritual. But I think here in the islands, um, Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, my experience has been that we tend to lump some Micronesians with all of them. And I think part of the communication strategy is how do you help um, the rest of us um, understand them from the standpoint of they have different cultural traditions and so on. So I think that would be what I would like to leave you with. And more importantly, how many of you in here are Pacific Islanders outside the, outside the Hawaiian population? 
If you could just show your hands. Well, that's the statement I want to make. What are we doing to reach out? Because we only have two or three people, three participants, and I think we really got a lot of work to do because they're going to be part of, if not already, our uh, socioeconomic model in terms of some of the costs. So I think we really got to step it up, and I just want to leave you with that idea. I would also invite you to say that same statement in every session you are in today. I really would, because a lot of decisions are being made for this group without the representation that you speak about. Other questions? That's it. I want to thank uh, the uh, panel members, Robin, especially for stepping in at such a late uh, moment. Diane, Dr. Diane Paloma, and Dr. Neil Palafox. Mahalo.